One of the positive things that came about from COVID, particularly for my job, is I can Zoom people, and in fact, there's a church in Newmarket, and there was a guy from South Africa that applied. I had never met him. The church had never met him. They processed everything via Zoom. I processed everything via Zoom. They hired him without ever having met him in person, and he is there now. And I had the opportunity of processing a guy from Australia going to a church in London. So really, uh, Zoom and being able to do things like that. So Nate, Florida sounds like a good distance away, but you compare Australia and Cape Town and it's just next door. But I was impressed by this young guy and our, um, our process in hiring someone it's not horrible, but it's rigorous because we have a compatibility questionnaire <clears throat> that they have to fill out and a number of things that they have to read. Then if they're compatible, I send a letter of compatibility. Then there's a ministry application, a biblical literacy questionnaire, and some other things that they have to fill out. And finally, an interview. So when Tom mentions that he is processed, that he is uh, doctrinally sound, we try to make sure on behalf of the church so that when a church hires someone, they can believe that they accept the doctrine of the AGC. So that's all to say that I'm here today by request to, to preach at Nate's induction. And it's, it's an honor and it's a pleasure for me to do so. <clears throat> but I also have to admit that in preaching the Word of God, it's a great honor, it's a great privilege but it's also a great responsibility. So as I preach, I just pray that you would listen to God speaking to your heart. All I am is a spokesperson. The Word of God is a key. The Word of God is the important thing. And while the preaching that I like to do is expository, taking a passage and going through it, what I've done today is different because I just think that it's a good fit for the situation. Before we jump into the Word of God, let's pray. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, particularly Nate, as this is a great day for him. It's foundational day, even though he's been here for a year, he's not starting off. We realize that there's a level of commitment that is upped. But Father, as a congregation, and me as a preacher, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts and help us not only to believe you, not only to love you, but to trust you and to obey you. We do ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My sermon today has a real simple title, Walk with God. That phrase just kind of rang in my mind for a period of time. And I thought, okay, what passage in the Word of God can I use for walking with God, expositorily taking us through it? And initially, I thought of Genesis 5, verses 21 to 24, it says, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he followed, followed, fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And as much as I looked that passage, I just didn't feel comfortable taking a look at that and, and preaching through it. I mean, it's a wonderful illustration. It, it's foundational to me in, in walking with God. I would have liked to know what was it when he was 65 that, that triggered him in walking with God? What did he do when he walked with God? Well, I'm going to suppose that these things that I'm going to be mentioning today help us in understanding how he walked with God. So my challenge to you that I'm going to give right here at the beginning of the sermon is to walk with God. Will we say, yes, we will walk with God? Will I say, yes, I will walk with God? And for my benefit, I like things that are easy. And so there's four points to my sermon, and I'm just using WALK as an acronym. W, wonder. A, attitude. L, learn. K, know. Maybe somebody can come up with something better, but this is something that in thinking about has resonated with, with my heart. So for the W, it's wonder. 
And by this, it's not, I wonder if God is real, but it's the sense of awe. And I think that I, that we, that Christians, that society has lost the wonder of God. I wrote some things down here. We are more impressed with great sports plays. I mean, we see a wonderful play, even if it's by, if it's by an opposing team, and we think, oh, wow, that's incredible. God, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. We're more impressed with expensive automobiles. We're more impressed with delicious food. Ugh, true. We're more impressed with fancy clothes. We are more impressed with people who have charismatic personalities. God? Yeah, yeah, God is important, but sometimes we lose the sense of awe about God. So all I want to do is remind you from scriptures. Instead of getting after you, instead of getting after myself, I want to read some scriptures which I hope will help us in understanding that God is wonderful. I start off with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do I believe that? Absolutely. That God is the creator of this world. In this world, even though mankind has not done a good job of following the directions that God gave in tending the garden, starting, starting with Adam and Eve, and there's an awful lot of things in this world that we have put into it which just are horrible. But it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first day, he divided light from darkness. The second day, God called the expanse heaven, and he created the dry lands. The third day, vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, trees bearing fruit. The fourth day, setting lights in the heavens, the sun to rule the day, and the, and the moon, the night, and the stars, and their creation. The fifth day, swarming creatures in the waters, and God making beasts of the earth according to their kinds on the ground. And then on the sixth day, God creating man in his own image. It's important enough that me, let me read verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, or over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And listen to verse 27, because three times it mentions something very important. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There's no mistake in what God is saying here. So after days one, two, three, four, and five, the, the final phrase that it mentions after God created those particular things, and it was good. And with God, good is not our understanding of good. It's fantastic because God did it. But then after the sixth day, when he created man and woman, it says, behold, it was very good. I love walking. So pretty well every morning, it, it's rare that I risk, miss a morning. This morning I walked for about an hour and a half. I live right beside Gage Park, which is a beautiful park in Hamilton. And it's great. I, I look and the flowers, the trees, the grass, I try not to look at the garbage or the garbage cans. But, you know, I walk around and I'm just in awe of what God has done. And think of what it was like when God created Adam and Eve. Such a beautiful paradise. But Job, Job is one that God challenged because Job had so many difficulties, tough circumstances in his life. I don't know how I would have handled them all. It would have been tough. It would have been rough. But it seems that in, 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 in his conversing back and forth with his three friends, that he was almost saying, 
if only God would stand up for me, then you guys would know that all your accusations were wrong if only God would stand up for me. So it doesn't seem as if he's blaming God, but it sounds like he is appealing to God to stand up for him. Now, God appears to Joseph. When God does appear and, and speaks directly to Job, he speaks of his creation. And if you want four chapters that speak in a marvelous way about God's creation, read Job 38 to 41 because they are marvelous. God says, did you create the rain? Did you create the snow? Did you create the ice? Did you create the eagles? And on and on and on. And the answer, of course, is no. So, what was Job's response to God's challenge to him? Did you create? Did you create? Did you create? In chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account, and what shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and now I will not answer. Twice, but I will proceed no further. In other words, he was basically saying, I'm overwhelmed by your wonder. I am in awe of you. But God continues on. And in chapter 42, verses 1 to 6, before the ending of the book of Job and before the marvelous things that God did to him at the end of the book of Job, but in 42, 1 to 6, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I, what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Nate, everyone in the congregation. Recapture the wonder of God. Good music can be a great help. Good preaching can be a great help. But the Word of God, that which Tom directed us to at the beginning of the induction service, that's the key in learning about God, but more about learning, because that's my third point. So, wonder. The second point is attitude. And essentially, I'm speaking of the battle that we have with pride. Christians aren't prideful, are they? Oh, no. You ever heard of board meeting fights? I, I know you never have them here, so this is strange language that you're hearing. Or battles between pastors, or battles between churches, or battles between denominations. Pride. How come pride rears its ugly face in the lives of Christians? How come? Well, it's because I think we give in to our humanity. And frankly, we're giving in to Satan. Apathy is a huge problem also. It's not something that I'm going to be centering on today, but, but realize that apathy, just not caring and not doing much, sitting back and letting everybody else do the work, is a huge problem, but pride is the one that I'm essentially addressing this morning. What is your attitude of God? Is it wonder? Is it awe? Or is it pride? Is it complacency? That's what Lucifer thought, pride. That was his sin. God created Lucifer. And Lucifer wanted to be equal with God, and frankly, it seems to me that he wanted to be more than God. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, is often referred to as the fall of Lucifer. The verses read, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Pride. 
that was Lucifer's problem. It became Adam and Eve's problem because Lucifer tempted Eve and said, did God really say that you couldn't eat that fruit? And she added to it in her answer, so she was wrong there. And then Lucifer said, you know what? He's not really going to kill you. God says, eat of this and you will surely die. God isn't going to kill you because eating that fruit is going to make you equal to God. You're going to know as much as he does. It appealed to her. And where was Adam? It seems as if he was right there when she ate. Watching. That's the sense that I get when I read Genesis chapter 3. Realizing what she did. And maybe he didn't want to be separated from this beautiful wife. I don't know his thinking, but he ate of the fruit too. Pride. God said this, but frankly, I don't care because it looks good and I'm going to eat it. Maybe I'm being a little bit harsh, but essentially that's what happened. So it happened with Lucifer. It happened with Adam and Eve. They sinned. They listened to Satan's lie. He was telling them it was okay to not believe God and not obey God. So they ate of the fruit. When Cain killed his brother Abel, the reason was that he was jealous of Abel. Genesis 4, verses 2 through 5. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And bottom line, he killed his brother. Lucifer, Adam and Eve, Cain, but there's one more that I want to bring to your attention, and it saddens my heart to do so. Jonah. Jonah did not want a revival for the Ninevites. A little bit of a backstory. Some of the most hated people at that period of time were the Ninevites. Nineveh was the capital of the Babylonian Empire, and they did some horrible things, horrific things. If, if I told you some of the things, you'd probably leave the service with those thoughts. But let me tell you, when I mention horrible things, they were horrible things. They were Gentiles. They weren't Jews. They didn't believe in God. They had their own gods, small g. But Jonah... You know the story. He went in a boat. He was thrown off because he said, I'm the one that, that's brought this storm off. Throw me, the, throw me overboard. They threw him overboard. The sea calmed down. The great fish came and it swallowed him and spewed him out on land. He finally went to Nineveh. He preached a short, short message. You know, you're going to die if you don't repent. You're going to die if you don't repent. Well, guess what? The people repented. And here's Jonah's response. It's ironic because these are verses that I can refer to to show part of the character of God, but Jonah is blaming God for saving the Ninevites. Can you imagine? That's just like blaming God that he saved Paul the Apostle, known as Saul at that time. These verses, Jonah 4, 1 to 3, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly that the Ninevites repented, that they were saved, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are, and listen to it, what he says is good, but he's blaming God. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Can you imagine? He's saying, these horrible, terrible people have become believers. They are believing in God. They are repenting. I hate that. Please take my life. It's not worth living. But I wonder if we do the same thing. 
When we put our emotions before God, we're putting ourselves before him, and isn't, isn't that in part maybe a definition of pride? Micah gave some great advice in being humble before God. Micah 6, 8, he has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Pride or humility? Walk, W, wonder, we've lost the awe of God. A, attitude, is it one of pride or is it one of humility? The L in walk, learn. Theology is learning about God. So in a way, we all need to be theologians because we all need to study the Word of God and to learn from it. God gives us a great invitation in Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. So he says at the beginning of that verse, come, let us reason together. Some people think that Christians, you know, when they become Christians, they, they kiss their brains goodbye. Not true. We might disagree with people, but there are wonderful scientists, there are wonderful um, doctors, there are wonderful mathematicians. There are, you can take pretty well any form of work that we have. And there are some Christians that are doing wonderful jobs. We don't kiss our brains goodbye, but we commit them to learning about God. Just listen to some of these verses about learning. Deuteronomy 5.1, Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules I speak to you in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Come to me, all who are all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. John 6, to 46, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Taught, heard, learned. Learning is so important. Church, small groups, Bible studies, all of these different things. Take any and every opportunity that you can without neglecting your spouse, without neglecting your children, without neglecting your job, but take advantage of opportunities of learning about God. Philippians 4, 8 and 9 say, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I've counseled a lot of people, and every pastor has counseled a lot of people in their lives. And, and one of the things that people have is they have problem with a certain sin in their lives. And they really want to know how can they not think about it. Well, you know, we're funny as human beings because you try not to think about something and you think about it more. You know, that's, that's the way that it works. I try to think about the Montreal Canadiens last year when they made the Stanley Cup Finals, and I am still a Montreal Canadiens fan, but do you understand, and I say this with a heavy heart, they're the first team to ever finish 32nd in the NHL. Oh, that's rough. That is rough. But wait till next year. <laughs> wait till next year. I heard something. <laughs> you know, learning. I have more verses here. But let me just summarize it this way. 
All these verses speak of learning about God. Have you learned about Him? Are you learning about Him? Do you want to learn about Him? It's desire. And I'm not saying believing in God in the way that the demons do because they know that Jesus is real. They don't trust Him, though. So that brings me to the fourth point, the first one, wonder, the second one, attitude, the third one, learn, and the last one, know. This is the last of the letters of the word walk and our last point. In a way, it's the most important word. The whole purpose of having a church is to know God. The whole reason for having a pastor is to help you learn about God and to know Him. And again, I would like to read some verses to you. This is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verses 38 to 40. Driving out before you nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in to give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Know, therefore, today, and lay it, lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. Psalm 46, 10, wonderful verse. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, I have to admit to you, we sometimes report, report that, or, or recite the verse this way. Be still and know that I am God. And you see, I think we miss the point of it I think it's saying, be still and know that I am God. When I retired, the church secretary, I, I saw something funny, and so I copied it to her. And it's this guy laying and reclining on a beach, you know, in his big chair. He has um, earphones on. He's listening to music and everything like that. And the caption to it is basically, I wonder how come I don't hear God speaking to me anymore? It's because there's so many other things drowning out God. Now, I realize if you're a mom and you have little children, it is tough being still. You know, you wake up in the morning and you have to prepare for the day. You go to bed at night and you're just exhausted. Some guys, and, and I've been there, work a couple of jobs and they work, you know, 64, 70, 75 hours a week. Students, I mean, you're, you, you've got essays to write, you've got books to read, you've got articles to prepare. How can you find time for God? Now, I'm not being very kind to you when I say this. Make time for God. That's what you've got to do. You've got to make time for God. Capture seconds or minutes, or hours, and make time for God. One of the things, I've already mentioned this to you, one of the things that I love to do is walking. And when I walk, I don't wear earphones. Some people do, and you might listen to messages that way, and I certainly don't want to take that away from you. But for me, I love walking and thinking. And thinking about God is one of the best things that I can do. I've processed sermons in my mind as I've walked and just seeing some of the things around me. But be still and know that I, got, that I am God is something that's very special. It's taking time, it's making time, and it's spending that time with God. I had a challenge from one of the men in my church. This is around 15 or 20 years ago. And he had read this verse, and he had done this exercise with somebody else. And he said, Paul, would you like to do this with me? Uh, can we meet at the church on a Saturday morning? You know, nothing to do, no meetings or anything like that. So we did. And we, we read some verses, and we went our way for, I think it was about an hour. So I went to kind of an upper room in the church, left the light off, it was dark, and I was trying to think about God. And, you know, when you're trying to think about God, it, you think of a lot of other things. But over a period of time, I realized God is here. I need to listen to him. I need to allow him to work in my heart. So when I met together with a guy, he said, is there anything that God really impressed upon you? Well, I had kind of struggled um, whether or not I should preach through the book of Ecclesiastes. Great book, tough book to preach from. 
And it was a great challenge, and I'm not sure, I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do that, but God impressed upon my heart. Now, I don't know if God's going to impress on your heart or your heart or your heart to preach through the book or to teach through the book of Ecclesiastes, but that's a challenge that God gave to me, and I was blessed, and I trust that the people in the church were blessed too. But be still. We've lost the sense of being still. There's some people, and my wife isn't here, and hopefully she's not going to watch YouTube, otherwise I'm in trouble. But um, she's always doing things, mostly for the benefit of other people. You know, when we visited my sister when, when she was alive, she would clean my sister's house, and my sister loved it. So being still, being quiet was not an easy thing for her, but she takes and makes time to do that. So my challenge to you is to take and make time. There's other verses, Isaiah 4, 28, or 40, 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the earth, of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Ephesians 3, 18 to 20. May have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 1 John 5, 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I was in a, a gospel singing group in the, wow, I guess it was the 70s. <clears throat> I was in a gospel group in the 70s, and I remember speaking to someone, I gave him the gospel, and so after giving the gospel and him saying that he did believe, <clears throat> I, I asked, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die? Well, I, I, I hope so. So, <clears throat> I quoted this verse, 1 John 5, 13. And then I said, same question, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven when, when you die? Well, I think so. And I said, can I use your name and put it in this verse? I forget what his name was, but let me use Paul. So I'll, 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 write, I'll read it here. I write these things to Paul, who believes in the name of the Son of God, that Paul may know that he has eternal life. And you know, in looking at his eyes when I was reading that, it's as if a light turned on. I said, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven when, when you die? He said, yes, I do. How do you know? because that's what the Bible says. So, do you know God, or do you believe just that He's real, and you think that's good enough for you? Or you, you want to go along with the crowd, maybe for your benefit, maybe for your family's benefit, maybe for financial benefit, I don't know, but you're saying, okay, I believe in God, but I, I don't know Him. I don't know Him in this intimate way that it talks about in this verse. I am challenging you to know God if you have never believed and trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you need to. I think it was at a conference that Tom helped set up this past week when, when somebody said, when we tell God that we love Him, that's good, but when we tell God that we trust Him, that's better. Because it's putting feet to belief. So knowing God is believing that Jesus died for you and tr you trusting him as savior. So to know him is to talk with him, to talk with him is to walk with him. My Jesus, my savior, my friend. What are some of the things that we've gone over? God is great, he is greatly to be praised. That sense of wonder. Pride can separate us from God. Don't let pride come between you and God. Our attitude needs to be one of humility before God. And then finally, learn about God and know Him so that we can tell others about Him. 1 Peter 3.15, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone 
who asked you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. And there's three things that I want to leave, to you, leave with you in applications. Number one, do you desire to walk with God? And does your life show that? Can people see that? Number two, does our pride keep us from walking with God? There's some things that we want to hold on and say, God, you know, you've got most of my life, but there's this little sin that I really enjoy doing, and I'm going to do it, and I don't care what you're going to do in my life. That's really what we're saying when we don't want to give up a sin. Does pride restrict you from God using you? And then finally, and this goes along with a verse that I just read, 1 Peter 3.15, how well can you use the Scriptures when talking about God? Let's pray. Father, I pray that Nate walks with you. Already he's had an impact upon the church. And may that impact and influence grow, and may he walk with you. But Lord, for every person here, I pray either, if they've never trusted Christ as Savior, that they would believe that Jesus died and paid for their sins, and trust him as God who took on flesh, who died but rose again victorious over sin, Satan, and death. And Father, I pray for believers. There are some people here who are your wonderful servants, and we recognize that. But there are some maybe sitting back and not walking with you the way that they should. I pray that your word would challenge their hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.